Okay, I'm going to call to order the Tuesday, May the 5th, 2020 meeting of the Iredell County Board of Commissioners. At this time, I would uh, ask everyone to please uh, bow your head in a moment of silent prayer, and especially to uh, remember uh, Jean Haup, Commissioner Haup, who is not with us uh, this evening. Uh, Mr. Marvin Norman is uh, calling in, but uh, Commissioner Haup uh, had... Uh, emergency exploratory surgery last uh, Friday and followed up uh, by uh, more surgery today and he's out of the woods and he's recovering uh, but he'll be in the hospital for uh, several days to the end of the week so we would just ask you to keep him in your prayers. So we'll all bow our heads please. Please stand for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Uh, Ms. Jones, are there any adjustments to the agenda? No, sir, Chairman Mallory, there are no adjustments. Okay, there, there will be one item of new business. I'll just give an update on some of our uh, latest uh, guidance from uh, the governor in terms of uh, COVID restrictions. Okay, uh, we move on. Uh, we do not have any uh, presentations of any uh, recognitions or awards this evening, uh, but we do have an appointment before the board. A uh, presentation uh, by Tanya Fowler and perhaps Amy Isley uh, from uh, Stop Child Abuse Now, otherwise known as SCAN. Uh, I would inquire, are you ladies on the line? Yes, I'm here. Yes. Okay. Yes. Uh, I would note that... Uh, can you hear me? Yes, we can hear you. And I would just note that uh, uh, these proceedings are being broadcast. Uh, we are observing the uh, strict social distancing and uh, maximum number of 10 in our meeting chamber. And so as we have public hearings, by the way, uh, if there's anyone that has chosen to physically appear, uh, then um, you'll see people cycle out of the rooms to, to allow uh, the additional uh, people to keep us under our magic number of 10. So, um, if you could uh, please uh, go ahead and just identify yourself for the record, and then uh, the floor is yours. Is that Tanya or Amy? I'm sorry, I'm having trouble hearing you. Uh, I, I can't understand what you're saying. Well, I can understand what you're saying, so you just go ahead. Ms. Fowler, if you'll go ahead with your presentation, we can hear you just fine. Okay, thank you. Uh, I, just, I think there's an echo or something, so I'm having trouble making out what you're saying. But thank you very much, uh, Commissioners, for having me uh, tonight. Um, I am here to speak to you um, about the impact that SCAN has on the children and the families in this community, but more specifically on the impact that we have on our county budget. The letter that you received in February from SCAN included a request for funding in the amount of $50,000. Yes, I can hear you. Yeah, I can, we can hear you. I can understand what you're saying, so you just go ahead. Okay. <laughs> It's a delay. Um, so I wanted to explain how that money will actually save the county hundreds of thousands of dollars each year. 
Before I do that, though, it's important to make sure that each of you understand exactly what SCAN does. Um, I know that when I started working at SCAN in December, I had lived here for 16 years. And uh, I had been to many SCAN events. I had supported them, but I really never understood exactly what they did or how they helped prevent or end child abuse. So it's very important to me to make sure that the community and especially leaders like you are aware of the importance and the depth of what SCAN does. Uh, maybe you've heard it said that children should come with a manual. Well, that is exactly what we are. We are that manual for parents. Simply put, SCAN offers parenting solutions. The staff teaches positive parenting skills, helping parents learn how to set boundaries, problem solve issues, how to discipline their children in an appropriate but effective way, and so much more. We do this through a variety of programs, including parenting classes, weekly in-home visits, or visits at our office, providing in-the-moment training with our parenting. We also have support groups for foster and adoptive parents, providing an outlet and support for those parents that are navigating very unique and challenging obstacles. Our staff is caring and non-judgmental, and that helps build the trust with our clients and increases our effectiveness. We help parents locate community resources so that children have all of their needs provided for. As the only agency of its kind in this county and surrounding counties, and has become the premier resource for positive and healthy parenting solutions. Unfortunately, for many of the parents that we work with, we are breaking a cycle of abuse or neglect that has lasted generations. They came from an abusive home, as did their parents and their parents before them. So they may not even realize that there are better and healthier ways to parent because they've never been taught or seen it modeled. With our intervention and education, we are ending that cycle of abuse for generations to come. If you, uh, you should have a handout that I sent in, and if you'll refer to that handout on number two, you will see the results from just one of our five programs uh, in our last fiscal year. And the 2018-19 program year, we served 63 children in the Parent Aid Program. While this program is open to anyone in Iredell County as a free service, the vast majority of our clients are referrals from the Iredell County Department of Social Services, which means that these families have already had a case opened against them and have been working with DSS. Once they refer to us, uh, and Parent Aid then goes into the home weekly and spends time working with the parents, teaching parenting skills and helping to implement those skills. They're on call for that family 24-7 should any questions or issues arise. Our parent aides meet the families where they are, figuratively speaking, and so the schedule is adjusted according to the client's progress and not an agency policy. Most of our cases last 12 to 18 months, but it can even go longer if needed. This long-term commitment to the family increases the success rate drastically. We have many former clients that still reach out to their parent aid for support or for celebrating milestones long after their case is closed. This is evidence of the strong relationships that are built during this progress, during this process. Out of those 63 children that we served last year, 61 of them were able to remain in the family home with no further reports being made. That's a 97% success rate for our parent aid program. So how does this affect your budget? Well, as you know, the cost of foster care is astronomical. Finding quality foster parents can be very difficult. If those 61 children that we served had gone into foster care instead of staying in the home, based on their ages and their needs, it would have cost this county over $1.13 million for just one year. And the likelihood that they were only in foster care for one year is very slim, so this number continues to grow year after year as new cases are added. SCAN's program works, and it does reduce the amount of Ardell, the, the amount that Ardell County is paying for foster care. SCAN staff works with the families to develop a routine and stability in the home so that parents are able to focus on their employment and education. So we position those families towards upward mobility, um, allowing them to stay employed and contribute to our community rather than withdrawing from its resources. This creates a reliable and accountable employee, which increases the tax base and creates quality human capital. 
With more funding, we can keep our current services in place and expand to serve more families, further reducing the number of children going into foster care, and more importantly, ending the cycle of abuse for good. We truly appreciate the support that you've given SCAN in years past. We believe more financial support could offset more than $1.13 million in your foster care budget this year. An investment in SCAN truly is an investment in all of Ardell County. I thank you for your time tonight and for your consideration. Um, and if you have any questions, we are available. Uh, any questions for uh, Tanya? Uh, Tanya, I would just like to say on behalf of the board, uh, we appreciate very much the great work that SCAN does. Uh, your network of volunteers, as you rightly pointed out, produce uh, results, and they are a tremendous value for the uh, investment. Uh, and the cost avoidance that we are able to achieve, particularly through DSS uh, referrals, to have parents be able to get the skills they need to uh, retain custody of their children or to be reunited with their children uh, is uh, not only just a great result, but it is a uh, cost saver. The uh, cost of foster care is significant, and that's borne by the taxpayer. Uh, so uh, once again, uh, you all have been a great leader in our community of taking care of children. Uh, it's it's uh, The demand curve hasn't gone down any. And uh, so you're that much more critical, and certainly uh, you will get uh, every due consideration through our budget process. And uh, we wish you the very best, and thank you again for all that you do for all of our citizens, and especially those young citizens that need somebody looking out for them. At this time... We'll move on to public hearings. We have four public hearings this evening. Uh, I would note that uh, we have several folks that are signed up uh, to be heard, and I believe that they are uh, on the phone line even now, standing by. Um, if anyone in the general public would like to dial in, the number is at the bottom of your screen, I believe, which is 704 878 3051. So I'll say again, it's 704 878 3051. The time limit for uh, speaking is uh, three minutes. And, and if I may, for anybody that's watching, please understand there is about a 10 second delay. So um, what, what is occurring in the room and what you see on the TV or things of that nature, there is a delay. So we're going to try to be sensitive to that, but um, if you're watching, just understand there is a little bit of a delay, about 10 seconds. All right. Uh, the first matter, agenda item 7.1, is a uh, request to uh, consider a request from Stephen Overcash of ODA Architecture PLLC to revise the heavy business conditional use conditions associated with approximately 2.83 acres at 2059 Charlotte Highway. So uh, Mr. Uh, Matthew Todd will uh, take us through the, the details here. Uh, good evening to the board. The, uh, the first request we have before us uh, was initially rezoned just a couple years ago. It's a highway business conditional district. At that time, it was re rezoned um, with the idea that it was going to be many stores with some other retail uses. And there was a limitation put on having outdoor access. This The mini warehouse was to be all interior access. Well, since then, the proposed use actually would like to have some outdoor roll up doors, no outdoor storage, but they want the doors that roll up on the outside of the building. In order to do that, they're having to come back through this process to, con to change those conditions that were put on it a couple years ago. It would still have that retail component um, that's listed in the application. They've limited those uses, but it would still have the potential for a varying degree of some retail uses with the mini store. Right here, Mr. Todd. 
Mark yes. Marmon, you're saying you cannot hear Mr. Todd? I hear him at all. Okay. We're working on that, sir. Okay, can you hear me, Mr. Norman? How about it now, Marvin? Can you? Not yet. Not yet. I think you're going to get hold it about put away from you. Okay. Uh, the the staff is supporting this request. Planning board recommended nine to zero to approve this request. It matches the land use plan. You can see it there. It's medium density residential, which does allow for small scale residential uses. At the uh, public input meeting, there was some concern about the retail uses, but that concern did not resurface at the planning board meeting. Uh, there's actually no opposition at the planning board meeting. Again, from this aerial, you now have Hope Lumber adjacent to the property. You do have some residential uses across the road and to the north of the site. So this property to the right on the screen is now Hoke Lumber and in behind the proposed site. You can see Hoke Lumber in behind the parcels. Uh, looking north up toward the uh, fire department and Dollar General looking directly across the road. And again, staff is recommending approval of this and there was no opposition at planning board. The planning board recommended unanimous to approve this request. Are there any questions uh, for Mr. Todd? Mr. Todd, have you had any conversation with the town of Mooresville about this particular rezone? Uh, yes, with all our rezonings, we do reach out to the town. Uh, the town, I think, did have some concern. They, they do have some concern about, you know, the continued commercial stripping out of that area. Again, this was already existing commercial. It's just changing the conditions at this point. Okay. Marvin, can you hear what Mr. Todd said? Uh, he said it's a little bit in now. Not moving like Tommy. Yeah, this particular. with that mic, or. Yeah, okay. we're, we're, we're still tweaking on some things on that. Let me recap just a little bit if you can hear what I'm saying. This is. you good. This is just north of the Hoke Lumber Company, which is M1 at this time. This particular piece of property is just asking for a revision so they can utilize outside garage doors on their mini storage. None of these doors will be facing Charlotte Highway. They will be all facing the side and, 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 and the rear of the property. And uh, Mooresville had some concerns that this particular corridor was filling up with commercial. I think uh, reading in the, the, the handout here, they were concerned that too much commercial would overload the traffic on that highway. Uh, but from what I read, traffic is well within the parameters of, um, of, of acceptable on this. Um, so I'm not sure with that M1 setting the precedent there, I think you're going to see between there and the V point a lot of commercial in the future. Would you agree, Mr. Todd? If you follow the land use plan at this point, the, uh, the area between here and north with the existing Dollar General actually is slated to stay medium density residential. So this is basically the edge of what you would potentially see for commercial. Okay, so, so the rest of the neighborhood across the street and the property that lies north of the subject piece today, we can expect to see medium residential? Based on the plan at this time. Okay. You understand, Marvin? I can hear everything you said. Okay. Okay. All right. Any further comments? Okay. Hearing none, I will open the public hearing. And I will note for the record that the following individuals have signed up and are standing by, uh, I believe as a group, Stephen Overcash, who's the applicant, Dennis Norwood, who's the general contractor, Jacqueline Overcash, who's also property owner, along with Kevin Clark, property owner, 
and Brian Simpson. So uh, if any of you would like to uh, have anything to say, uh, if you would identify yourself and uh, share with us your residential address for the record, and then you'll be able to speak. If there's no one that wants to uh, contribute anything further, then we'll just uh, wait for any potential calls. That's you. Anyone that's on the conference call, would it be possible for you to turn the volume down on your computer if you're watching the meeting live? That's what's causing our, our feedback loop. If you can turn your computer volume down and just speak over the telephone, I believe we can uh, communicate successfully. Mr. Overcash, do you have... Uh, Anything you'd like to add to this public hearing? No, sir. Um, it's basically the same as TNS was approved a few years ago uh, with just a couple of modifications. We've had our neighborhood meetings and really had no, no major opposition. Okay. Thank you, sir. Anybody else wishing to speak to the rezone on Charlotte Highway in no particular order? Please listen to the phone because the internet is going to be a slight delay. That's built into it. Anybody else wishing to speak on the rezone on Charlotte Highway? No, thank you. All right, we'll assume that everyone that had signed up has had an opportunity to be heard and uh, that uh, Mr. Overcash has uh, spoken for everyone. Uh, I would uh, acquire again if there's anyone in the general public that wants to dial in. Now is the time to do that. We'll give you about 30 seconds. Uh, there is a 10 second delay between uh, what you're hearing and when we'll hear that you're on the line. That phone number again is 704 878 3051. Ask one final time anyone wishing to speak to the Charlotte Highway rezone, the revision to the rezone, if you will speak up on the conference call, we'll be glad to take your opinion. Mr. Chairman, I think that's mm -hmm. well vetted, sir. Okay. Uh, hearing no further uh, comments, I'll inquire of anyone sitting in the audience. Raymond, would you like to be heard? <laughs> Okay, I'll close this public hearing and ask if uh, there's a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would make the motion to approve the zoning map amendment and to make the finding that the approval is consistent with the adoption of the 2030 Horizon Plan and that said approval is reasonable and in the public's best interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 Horizon Plan because it is within the medium density residential designation which allows for small scale uh, neighborhood commercial use. It adjoins existing and more intensive commercial use and the proposed condi conditions protect the surrounding property values which li while limiting the list of HB uses to include only those that should not exceed existing road capacity, sir. Motion by Vice Chairman Bowles. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Marvin? Mr. Norman, are you an aye or a nay? 
He's an aye. Thank you, sir. The ayes have it unanimously. Motion carries. Now move on to item 7.2, which is a public hearing to consider a request from Nate Overholt of Pineview Buildings to rezone approximately 38.08 acres along Tomlin Mill Road. Uh, Mr. Todd, and lean into the mic if you would. Yes, this, this request outlined on the screen in blue is currently zoned Highway Business and RA. The uh, staff does recommend approval of this request based on it matching the 2030 plan. It's adjacent to existing commercial uses. And it also brings in, there is an existing business on the HB piece. It would bring that into conformance with the zoning requirements. Planning Board did recommend unanimously to approve this one as well, and there is no opposition at the Planning Board hearing. Again, you can see the land use plan showing that conceptually this area would be highway interchange commercial. It's right there at the interchange with Tomlin Mill and 77. You've got Lowe's distribution uh, that accesses this interchange. Again, you do have an existing uh, business on the property, and then they're looking to expand on the adjacent track. Just a couple aerial images. The existing business. Uh, looking east on Tomlin Mill Road, away from the interstate. Looking directly across Tomlin Mill and back toward the interstate with the uh, property on our left. And again, there was no opposition at Planning Board and there was a una unanimous recommendation to support this request. Uh, any additional questions or comments? Be straightforward. Okay. Straight out. Good. All right. At this time, I will open the public hearing and note that uh, Irvin Helmuth, the property owner, and Nate Overholt, the applicant, uh, have signed up. And I would inquire are they able to hear me? And if uh, so, have anything that you'd like to uh, uh, address to us at this time. You can go ahead and do that and please identify your name and your residential address. Mr. Helmer, Mr. Overholt, do you have any comments at this time during the public hearing? Irvin and Nate, can you hear me? Well, clear, I suppose. Okay, you can hear me, Marvin. Hear you very well. This yes. is the, this is the thirty-eight acres at Tomlin Mill and I seventy-seven, straight up rezone, highway business, residential agriculture, to general business. There will be no conditions on this. It's a straight rezone. All right, hearing uh, no additional, uh, apparently uh, Mr. Helmuth and Overholt don't have anything to add. Uh, I would inquire if there's anyone in the audience or anyone in TV land that would like to uh, uh, call in. That number is 704-878-3051. And I think it's not just a 10-second delay, but probably more like a 25 to 30 second delay. Mr. Overholt, Mr. Helmer, do you have anything to add to the public hearing? They're speaking in favor of it, right? Yeah, I'm sure they are. Yes. Yeah, if that's the case, why don't we just make the motion? Let's do it. I'm sure, they, well, they'll be happy. Yep. Well. Go ahead, hearing no further interest in being heard, close the public hearing and ask if there's a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make the motion. Motion to approve the zoning map amendment. 
and to make a finding that the approval is consistent with the adopted 2030 horizon plan and that said approval is reasonable and in the public interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 horizon plan because it is in harmony with the highway interchange commercial and employment center industrial flex space office areas is adjacent to existing commercially zoned properties and would bring the existing use into better zoning compliance. Motion by Commissioner Robertson. Any further discussion? Hearing none, all in favor, please say aye. 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 Robertson, aye. Any, any nays? Motion carries unanimously. We move on to item 7.3, which is a public hearing to consider a request from Jonathan Carter of Bluestone Land Management PLLC to rezone approximately 1.11 acres at the corner of Absher Farm Loop and Taylorsville Highway. Mr. Todd? Uh, yes, this request, again, is currently zoned residential agricultural. There is an existing gas station that sits at this intersection that's basically a legal non-conforming gas station. They, they're looking to expand and in order to expand they need to get the property rezoned so they can do so. It, it does match the land use plan. Uh, there is no opposition at planning board and planning board recommended unanimously to approve this one. And staff does support. By uh, showing the land use plan, the that that triangle, I'll say, of the sandwich between the two roads is rural commercial. It's across from some industrial uses with residential in behind. Uh, you can see the area with the existing gas station. A few pictures of the property. 289. <laughs> Looking back towards Statesville with the industrial across the road. Railroad tracks directly across the road. Looking north back up toward Taylorsville. I'd be happy to answer any questions with this one. So this is right across from Bucks Industrial Park? Yes. Uh, any uh, questions for Mr. Todd? I will go ahead and open the public hearing. I'll note that uh, Jonathan Carter, the applicant, has uh, signed up to be heard. Uh, Mr. Carter, are you on the telephone? I don't have anything to add to the uh, presentation. Uh, I'll take any questions if you have. Okay. Anybody have any questions for Mr. Carter? I don't believe we do. Uh, is there anyone else that would like to be heard on this matter? I would inquire if you can call in at 704-878-3051. And we'll give you about 20 seconds. Thank you, Mr. Carter, for standing by. We have a delay on the uh, live feed on the internet that's built into the system, and we want to give everyone ample opportunity to call in, but we thank you for your patience. Okay, hearing no, no one online, I would inquire of anyone that's uh, here uh, if they'd like to be heard. Raymond? <laughs> Not even Raymond wants to be heard. We will close the public hearing, and I'll ask if there's a motion. Mr. Chairman, I'll make the motion to approve the zoning map amendment and to make a finding that the approval is consistent with the adopted 2030 horizon plan and that said approval is reasonable and in the public interest and furthers the goals of the 2030 horizon plan because it is contained within a rural commercial area and it brings an existing legal non-conforming use into zoning compliance. And traffic impacts should not exceed road capacity. Motion by Commissioner Robertson. Any further discussion? 
Mr. Chairman, I think this is exactly what we need to do in zoning is clean up some of these areas and allow folks to expand and be prosperous in our county. Exactly. Uh, any th further comments? Marvin, have you heard everything? Any questions? Mr. Norman, do you have any comments or questions? No, I'm fine. Okay, thank you, sir. All right. All in favor of the motion, please say aye. 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 Pose like, pose like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Okay, we'll now be moving on to our next public hearing which is to consider revisions to the Iredell County Personnel Ordinance. And I believe Sandra Gregory uh, is here to uh, share with us uh, a brief overview. Uh, this is an ordinance that we reviewed in uh, a great deal of detail at our winter retreat in February. And uh, after hearing some feedback from commissioners, uh, some revisions were made. They were brought back, and we've reviewed them, and we're now here at the public hearing. So, Ms. Gregory, if you would like to summarize. Sure. Thank you. Um, I'll start out with Article 2 of the Personnel Ordinance. That is the pay and, class pay and position classification plan. We are requesting that the probationary step increase section of this policy be removed. This section states, upon satisfactory completion of the initial probationary period, employees hired at or promoted to step eight or below the position classification may be given a 4.5% increase. This has not been utilized since approximately 2009. And um, this will help us to, if we remove this, it will help us to reduce the risk of compression issues between new employees and long-term employees so I do recommend that that be completely removed from the ordinance. Another area in Article 2 is a couple of years ago, the board approved the redefining of promotions and reclassifications. And for purposes of determining the appropriate amount of pay increases uh, is why that was done for each classification. However, that ordinance was actually never changed uh, to support those definitions and the changes of those definitions. So for the record, I would like to just reiterate the definition of these two and what they actually mean for purposes of, of, of administering this policy. A promotion is defined as an individual moving from a non-supervisory position to a supervisory position. At the discretion of the county manager, it may also apply to an individual moving from a lower level of management to a higher level of management supervising more employees. A promotion equates to a maximum of a 9% increase or to the minimum step of the new grade, whichever is more. Then the reclassification is defined as the reassignment of an existing position from one class to another based on changes in job content, which may or not be the same job grade and are not in a supervisory role of any level. This equates to a 5% increase when one is reclassified. So it's a 9% for promotions, 5% for reclassifications. Uh, the third part of Article 2 is a couple of years ago, we outsourced our pay and classification study, and we made significant changes to our pay scale. So what we want to do is have the ordinance reflect what we implemented at that time. Um, we changed how we reviewed reclassifications for pay study purpose, purposes. So when we have a pay study moving forward, um, if a position moves from one grade to another, uh, the employee previously would receive an increase just for that pay grade on the, on the uh, pay increase on the position. So the revision that we made a few years ago um, and it was approved by the board, was to only ensure that employees were placed at at least the minimum pay range of their new grade, or if the salary is above that, they do not receive an increase for pay and classification study purposes. 
So it's basically changing the verbiage to support what we do. And that is all of the changes for Article 2. Then we had some changes on Article 7, and that is the separation, disciplinary action, and reinstatement article. And the changes we are requesting is requiring, number one, requiring that suspension for disciplinary purposes and or a demotion without pay to be used in conjunction with a final written warning. The second request is pre-dismissal letters being required to be given, in, given to employees within at least one business day prior to the actual meeting date, which allows the employee time for preparations for that meeting. The third change in Article 7 is employees will have the option to have the pre-dismissal meeting recorded, and they will be required to sign an agreement form identifying what their choice is. The recording and or transcript will become a part of the personnel of the employee's personnel file. It is not in the ordinance, but just so that we know, um, we, will, we can ensure recordings are done consistently. Um, all pre-dismissals will be held in the HR department, and either myself or the assistant HR director will be present for each pre-dismissal meeting, and we will control the, the recording part of it. The last part of that article we would like to change is having a non-disciplinary suspension without pay section added. This section will allow for management to suspend without pay during an investigation, hearing, or trial of an employee on any criminal charges brought by law enforcement or an indictment involving an employee. The investigation, hear investigation, hearing, trial, or civil action must involve matters that form the basis for disciplinary actions and be directly related to the essential functions of that individual's job. Um, the employee would have the option to use comp time or vacation in lieu of unpaid suspension during this time. The unpaid suspension would be capped at a maximum of 30 days. At the end of that 30 days, the case would be evaluated based on those circumstances of the suspension and in addition to the department needs. The suspension without pay, any suspension without pay beyond 30 days must be approved, must be approved by the county manager. Um, that concludes Article 7. Um, Article 6, we had just removed a very simple statement regarding service awards, um, employees receiving credit for service awards, um, years of service for the, let me start over and say that different. The, we removed the statement about employees receiving credit for the time worked um, in a part-time capacity for service awards recognition purposes. Now, we got that out right. Um, and then Article 9, we changed a small amount of verbiage. In Article 10, there were no changes. So that is the summary of uh, the articles we discussed in the fall retreat and the winter retreat and are requesting approval for those changes to be effective July 1st, 2020. Thank you, Ms. Gregory. Um, you, know, you spent a great deal of time with staff uh, nugging through all of these provisions, and uh, they have been uh, roundly uh, reviewed and discussed and cussed, and uh, I think uh, the general public has had uh, many opportunities at those open meetings to be able to uh, uh, share their thoughts. Uh, are there any questions or comments uh, from commissioners for Ms. Gregory? I do have one quick comment or question for our council. On the recordings that are made, is that something that could possibly be admissible in court if it, if it went that far? Yes, it could be. Okay. I just, I, I, in HR, I know because the sensitivity of the, the subject matter that you're discussing, HR should be the only one to hear that. I'm just wondering if HR is the best place to keep those recordings it should be part of their personnel file. Okay, so it, it, it's 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 in their lane completely. I didn't know if that would uh, bode uh, against us in court that we were keeping the recording. Well, it doesn't mean that it wouldn't be available to the other party. There would just be provisions for how that got released or who got to hear it and um, how it was dispersed. So, in a discovery motion, they'd get a copy of it. Most likely, okay. with probably with some conditions on it. Just curious. I didn't. Any additional questions or comments? Marvin, do you have any questions or comments? 
No, I'm fine. All right, at this time I will open the public hearing and uh, inquire as to whether anyone present would like to be heard. I don't see or hear any. And uh, once again, I would uh, mention that the number to call is 704-878-3051. And we will stand by for 30 seconds. Some Jeopardy music. <laughs> ding, ding, ding. Riveting television tonight, I am sure. All right, hearing uh, no one call in, I will close the public hearing. Uh, ask if there's a motion. Mr. Chairman, I would move that we accept this personnel ordinance change as written because so much time and effort has gone into this document. Uh, there are a lot of wills changed to mays and shalls changed to should or whatever, but uh, it, uh, it's definitely a piece that we have been needing for some time. I'd like to thank Ms. Sander for her diligent work in preparing this document mm -hmm. and all of the revisions and the, the drafts that we've gone through. Hopefully we've got a product here that's going to serve us for the next 10, 15 years in Iredale County. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, is there a motion? Yeah, yeah, that was that, the motion. Yeah. It was just a lengthy one. Yes. Okay. <laughs> I thought it got into a comment. Okay. All right. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 As opposed, like sign. We've got Mr. Norman with an aye. Okay. Motion carries unanimously. Thank you very much, Ms. Gregory. Thank you. We will now move on to uh, administrative matters, which are appropriate for our consent agenda. We'll handle this as we normally do. Uh, Ms. Jones or staff, if uh, she, if they are calling in, will share with us uh, an overview of the uh, items that are normally uh, administrative in nature, and then we will uh, indicate consent among uh, commissioners, and then we'll. End, uh, entertain a motion to approve this agenda as a package. So, uh, Ms. Jones, you can tee these up for us. Thank you, Chairman Mallory. The first item is a request from the Finance Department for approval of Budget Amendment Number 30 to appropriate additional grant funds Iredell Statesville Schools received for two school resource officers for elementary schools. And to give you a little background on this, they received a grant for um, two school resource officers that, that they did not anticipate. And as a reminder, all of this comes out of the school safety and security budget. So what they are wanting to do, because those funds have already been um, expended from that, they are asking to receive in these funds and then in turn allow them to expend those funds still in the safety and security budget to be used for safety and security capital items. And the capital items are, um, the, the amount of the grant is $66,666. And they are asking to uh, use those mo that money to purchase 15 bus cameras. So it's keeping it all in the safety and security budget, but um, receiving in the revenue for those and then expending out the expenditure for those bus cameras. I will also add, just as an aside, um, while we're doing this, they, are, they have seen some savings in that budget as well, in the safety and security budget, and they're asking to utilize savings on the yellow bus GPS tracking software. They were able to uh, get that at a lower price, and that would be in the amount of $29,200, and they want to use those funds to cover uh, costs for middle school security expenses. So you'll see that in your budget amendment, but the request is to receive in the SRO grant and expend it out. All right. Any questions or comments? Consent? Consent. 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 Uh, Mr. Norman? Consent? 
Mr. Norman, school funding grant? Are, yes, you, cons are you a consent? Yes. Okay, thank you, sir. He is. Thank you. The next item is a request from the Health Department for approval of the fee and eligibility policy revisions to be effective immediately and approval of the proposed clinical services, dental, and environmental health fee schedules. And if you recall, this is something we do every year um, for these fees. There are two different things, really, that we're, that we're asking approval of. The fee and eligibility policy revisions are effective immediately. And then the approval of the proposed clinical services, dental, and environmental health fee schedule will be effective July 1, and that will be for the upcoming fiscal year, which goes July 1 through June 30. The, um, in your packet, there are several pages that lists all the different fees and all the different specific um, fees for, for uh, lab fees and things of that nature. What they are requesting is basically to recoup costs. And some of them have gone up, some of them have gone down, and that's really based on the expense of running those labs and things of that nature. And I know that Commissioner Bowles is on that uh, health department uh, board, so if he has anything he'd like to add, I'll certainly defer to him. It's, it's, been, it's been hashed out and hashed out by Board of Health, and I think the product that we have before us this evening is... is best best effort uh, any further comments uh, consent consent Marvin consent consent on the yeah. okay health fees thank you sir thank you the next item is a request from the library for approval of budget amendment number 31 and to accept a State Library of North Carolina Library Services and Technology Act mini grant in the amount of $2,000 to assist with responding to the coronavirus pandemic. This is something that uh, they received notice that they had the ability to apply for this grant. It was a very narrow window. They did apply for the grant. They, they made myself aware and I notified the board that they were going to go ahead and apply because we could not get before the board before the application deadline closed. So they did make application and they were awarded the grant. So this is um, approval to accept that grant. It's $2,000 to the State Library and they want to use it to purchase materials for uh, COVID-19 in preparing as we go through the phase reopening to prepare to provide services and achieve the social distancing and put all the measures in place. And it's detailed in your packet that they are requesting to purchase with these funds masks, touchless thermometers, disinfecting wipes and spray, hand, san hand sanitizing stations, and supplies to create contactless service. So uh, that, that is the request. And I will say there are no matching funds required for this grant. Any questions, comments, consent? Consent. consent. Thank you. The next item is a request from Tax Administration for approval of appointment of the interim tax assessor. As uh, you all are aware, Ms. Malia Miller retired the end of April, and uh, this is a board appointed position. And so what we would like to ask your approval of is to appoint uh, Laura Carter as the interim assessor. Ms. Carter has been with the tax office for 30 years. She served 20 years as the personal property supervisor, 10 years as assess assistant assessor, and she also served as interim assessor in 2013. So this would be an interim assessor appointment until we can interview and permanently fill the position. So we do have to have an interim um, appointed by the board because it is a board appointed position until we can get the permanent replacement. Vote for it if you say assistant assessor five times really quick. You really don't want me to. <laughs> <laughs> I struggled one time. <laughs> we will uh, assume by acclamation that you can say that five times. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> Assuming might be safe in this case. You get constructive credit. <laughs> uh, well, I know Ms. Ms. Crater is highly qualified, and we certainly will miss uh, Malia Miller, but uh, you know, having someone right there bench they can jump right in there and do a very good job We're very pleased that uh, we have such a, a deep bench in, in all of our departments 
Um, Malia really did a, a great job. I'm going to, you know, these days of distancing and stuff, I, the, the tax office, you know, we all joke about the tax office. But the fact of the matter is, is you want your tax office to be efficient and fair. And, um, and I give uh, Bill Furches credit for his leadership at the top. But, I mean, he had some really, he, he has, and in the case of uh, Malia Miller, had some really competent folks that, that, had to, that had to know their stuff, had to be technically proficient, and were, and, and that makes the office run smooth, and that makes our jobs a lot easier because there aren't as many complaints. So uh, she'll be missed, and, uh, and hopefully this will be a relatively seamless transition. Yeah. Mr. Furches has a history of surrounding himself with very qualified people. Yes. Okay, any further comments? Uh, consent? Yes, sent. Consent for Mr. Norman. All right. Thank you. The final item is a request from the clerk to the board for approval of minutes from the meeting on April the 21st, 2020. Consent? Consent. No changes. <laughs> All right. Is there a motion to approve the consent agenda? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Commissioner Robertson. Any further discussion? All in favor, please say aye. 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 Those opposed, like sign. Motion carries unanimously. Mr. Norman was an aye, Bob. Yeah. Moving on uh, item nine, uh, there are no announcements of any vacancies uh, this evening. There are no appointments to any boards or commissions in item 10. Uh, no unfinished business I'm aware of. Um, this is not a public comment period uh, meeting. Uh, new business, uh, I'll just say that uh, Governor Cooper this afternoon at five o'clock uh, held a uh, news conference where he outlined uh, the executive order provisions uh, for executive order number 138, uh, which are to take in effect at 5 o'clock on Friday uh, and uh, basically moves the state as a whole through the first of three phases or into the first phase. Uh, I'd like to summarize very quickly, uh, if I can, the differences between the stay-at-home order and the cumulative orders that preceded it uh, with the uh, order that is coming to effect. And this phase one will be in place for, it's anticipated, two to three weeks, depending on whether or not uh, North Carolina as a whole meets certain criteria to pass through the gate to move on to phase two. Um, basically, the, in terms of commercial activity, uh, the stay-at-home order that was adopted uh, by the governor in uh, Executive Order uh, 121, I think it was, um, had a long list of essential businesses uh, and included in those businesses any business that can meet uh, social distancing criteria. At this time, all of those definitions are basically out uh, and that uh, uh, effectively uh, all businesses are able to operate except for ones that were specifically limited uh, such as the close contact personal services with barbers and beauticians, uh, as well as gyms and bowling theaters and uh, bowling uh, alleys, rather, and theaters and such. So uh, those specific restrictions remain in effect. Uh, the retail capacity is being increased from 20% uh, to 50%, along with cleaning and social distancing, People are encouraged uh, to continue to uh, shelter in place, uh, and uh, but instead of leaving home only for essential services, they can leave home for virtually any commercial activity uh, to any businesses that happen to be open. Uh, they uh, are continuing to limit 
gatherings to a 10 person limit uh, and that applies as well to uh, churches which uh, uh, can meet outside as long as you can maintain the social distancing criteria but inside a building it uh, continues to be a 10 person limit uh, child care centers uh, which have been open for essential workers only uh, will now be uh, able to open for anyone that is uh, needing their services uh, during uh, work. Uh, they continue to encourage teleworking. Uh, bars and restaurants continue to be limited to uh, takeout or delivery services and not uh, any in uh, building uh, sit-down services or bar uh, patronage. Uh, barbers, salons, and uh, theaters and music venues all remain closed. Gyms remain closed. Playgrounds remain closed. Uh, visitation at long-term care centers continues to be prohibited. Uh, worship services, as I mentioned, uh, outdoor services are allowed as long as social distancing is observed. Uh, one change uh, for the state purposes, uh, state parks and trails previously had been closed. Those are now going to be opened, uh, and uh, local jurisdictions are encouraged uh, to open their facilities uh, minus the playgrounds. And they are strongly encouraging uh, face coverings, uh, masks when you... Uh, frequent any of the uh, retail establishments or indoors uh, where you're not able to maintain uh, social distancing and uh, you're generally in a crowd going through a store. Uh, it's the right thing to do for other people, not just yourself. And it protects those employees who are exposed to everybody that walks through the door. So uh, one item that's... Uh, Interesting, a little different. Uh, previously, under uh, the governor's restrictions, local governments could have restrictions that were stricter, but not less restrictive than the state. Uh, they have carved out an exception for that in that it, rather than uh, allowing local jurisdictions to, let's say, have a uh, more stringent restriction on retail businesses, let's say stick with 20% instead of going to 50%, uh, in order to create uniformity across the state for retail businesses, uh, this phase one order basically amends all local prohibitions and restrictions imposed under local state of emergency declarations to remove any language that sets a different maximum, maximum occupancy standard retail businesses and as well uh, also forbids uh, local governments from uh, enacting a different maximum occupancy standard so the uh, for retail businesses so uh, we'll be able to this, this sort of hot off the press we'll be able to uh, digest this uh, over the next few days uh, I do do a weekly uh, update that's available to uh, catch on video on our county website. I would encourage you to uh, go to that on a weekly basis and we'll give you the latest updates in terms of Iredell County. Uh, I will say that uh, we uh, sent a letter to the governor at the direction of the board where we asked, uh, among other things, that uh, counties be allowed the ability if we can meet the the objective criteria that's been set out by the state that if we can meet them individually that we be able to move forward individually as a county into subsequent phases uh, which uh, obviously uh, allow for greater economic activity and leisure activity and such all of which though all of which are predicated on maintaining social distancing uh, that never goes away uh, in these phases. Uh, and the reason for that is because we don't want to, having fought a battle and won a hard-won victory in terms of not overwhelming our health care 
institutions, our hospitals and our clinics. Um, and by flattening the curve, uh, we, we basically push out, instead of spiking and overwhelming that and having lots of people with COVID at the same time, we're basically spreading that out over a longer period of time. So to keep from having a spike and then having to regress and have more stringent uh, restrictions imposed on us, we need to do what we need to do individually and practice personal responsibility as you exercise your personal choices. Um, we will continue to try to get a little more running room for the county and hope to uh, uh, have a, a conversation with the state to uh, try to achieve that. Uh, in any event, um, at this time, is there anything further for the good of the order? From uh, Chairman Mallory, did you receive any response whatsoever from the governor's office in, uh, relative to the letter that, that you sent on behalf of the Board of Commissioners asking that, that we be given some leeway and some freedom to make some choices for our county without being lumped into the, looking at the state as one big huge unit as opposed to a hundred separate counties. I haven't seen any uh, response yet, but it was a long letter. So I will uh, graciously Shocking. assume <laughs> that, uh, that uh, it's taking uh, his staff a little while to digest and that I hope that we will hear something from them uh, so that we can engage in a discussion. And on the press conference today, did they, did they give any indication of when we would take another look? You know, I mean, he, he announced phase one is, you know, is this Friday. I mean, are we going to look at it once a week, or did, did they... They, they, when they might open it up, and the, and the reason being, and the reason being, and I had not planned to elaborate on this point, but there was an awful lot of mention about these thresholds that had to be met of trends. The trend had to go down. Okay, we got six people in the hospital. We have three hospitals. We have three empty hospitals. Our trend for hospitalizations, I mean, there, we only have six people in. We can't have a big trend down. We can't keep this county shut down because, because we've got to go from six to five. If it goes from six to seven, that trend is going up. But it's only seven. There's 188,000 people in the county. So I, I, I think the letter that you wrote was good. I think everybody's been careful, and that's good. And I think looking forward, we're trying to do this in a measured and responsible way, and that's good. But the metric of looking at the, di at, at the direction or slope of a trend line doesn't make sense when the absolute numbers are in a good place. T today, Dr. Cohen did admit that the the upward ticks that they're seeing or upward trends that they're seeing is is direct correlation with more testing with more testing i mean right. she, she did admit that today she's been reluctant to say that in other press conferences but i think she had to say it today because it's obvious that the more testing you do the more positives you're going to find but that doesn't necessarily correlate with more beds in the hospital those are people that just tested positive uh, one of the items that I mentioned at some length, well, I won't go all into it, but, uh, you know, we have uh, some congregate care facilities, which include nursing homes and uh, prisons and jails and group homes, rehab homes, whatever, which are self-contained uh, living quarters. And uh, when they have an incident of COVID-19, it can spread very quickly inside those closed communities. Uh, and in the case of nursing homes, it can have uh, a uh, much greater uh, effect on the health and indeed uh, the mortality rates are much higher. So uh, the total number of cases reported in, uh, in, the, in the state um, 
for this population that represents about 2 to 3 percent of the total population, represents uh, in excess of 25 percent of the uh, actual known cases. So when you have that disparity between a known smaller group and the general population, then you should factor out the smaller group, focus on that, because that's where your greatest potential for harm is and the greatest potential for uh, uh, increased numbers. And you test and you limit the ability or you test the folks that interact between those closed systems and the general population, whether that's the employees, obviously, but also any visitors, also any uh, contractors that come in to do work in those facilities, as well as uh, new admissions and folks that are being discharged, uh, and physicians and other healthcare workers that come in. So if you focus on where you have that intersection between the general population and those small populations that are especially vulnerable, then you can really focus on the problem. The, the issue from the statewide application of these numbers is that it's, it's uh, causing the state numbers to continue to rise. And that doesn't have a thing in the world to do with what the general population does or doesn't do. You know, you can have great numbers in the general population, but just one or two cases can lead to a, a real catastrophe in some of these homes. So if you separate them out, you have, you're focused on where the real problem can be, and, and with limited resources of testing and uh, contact tracing, you need to focus where you can get your hands around the problem. And so we should be focused like a laser beam on these, these homes. And that also includes uh, some businesses, and I think everyone has heard about meatpacking, processing plants uh, that uh, have people in close quarters and also live in close quarters oftentimes because there's, there are seasonal uh, or labor. So uh, if you focus on the problem, then you can isolate it. You can try to fix that. As it is, it's just sort of... Uh, you know, poisoning the well for the general population numbers. And it also masks the severity of the numbers for those congregant care facilities because if they're just subsumed into the general population, you don't realize what a, what a uh, devastating impact it can have if you're not very, very careful. And I would say that we have had one instance, one person uh, in Idle County in a congregant home that tested positive so far. And that was it, you know. So kudos to that nursing home staff, uh, to the health department for jumping on that and making sure that that did not spread throughout the facility uh, or into the general population. That's a good news story. Uh, but some other counties have not been so fortunate. Uh, so um, we've asked the governor to consider a different way of looking at these numbers not changing the standard, it's just changing who you're looking at so you can focus your resources and get the right kind of uh, strategy to match up to achieve the objective. So uh, with that being said, uh, I'll uh, kick it over to our county manager for her report. Thank you, Chairman Mallory. Just a few brief items to report, but I do want to tack on to um, the board's comments regarding these long-term care facilities. I am very pleased with our health department and their choice to spend their funding that they received as in, in response to COVID-19. They're spending that funding that if we do have a situation or an outbreak in these long-term care facilities to do the testing, um, to bridge that gap where insurance may not cover or someone may not have appropriate insurance, they want to use that money to help and make sure that the testing is done and that it's appropriate in those facilities. And I can't say enough wonderful things about the decision that they made and how to use that funding. So um, we're also working very closely with all of our long-term care facilities to ensure that they have appropriate PPE. We're talking to them. We're going in. We're auditing. 
and giving them suggestions regarding cleaning, things of that nature. So we're doing everything that we can. I say we. They are doing everything that they can on their end to try to mitigate um, mitigate that issue with any long-term care facilities. So say great things about our health department and their choice of how to use that funding. Uh, just to give you a quick update on where we are in the budget process, I know that's something uh, we're drawing on to the witching hour. So I appreciate the board's patience in giving us a little extra time to get as updated numbers as we can possibly get. I will be presenting to the board at our next meeting on Tuesday, May the 19th, the proposed budget. Once I present that budget on the 19th, we will have, we have three scheduled workshops. The first one will be on Thursday, May the 21st from 9 a.m. until 1 p.m. The second one will be Tuesday, May the 26th from 11 a.m. to 3 p.m. And then the final one, if needed, will be Thursday, May the 28th from 1 until 4. We are going to do everything we can to try to minimize the amount of people that are there. Um, we're, we're still working through all the details about how we're going to conduct these budget workshops. And stay tuned because we'll give you more information as we get there. But that will be the schedule for the budget as we move forward. All intents and purposes of having an approved budget ready to go by July 1. Before you on the bench is a um, packet that looks like this, and that is the Sheriff's Office annual report that they delivered today, and it's a, there's one for each commissioner on, your, on the table. Also, uh, we've been working on some new charts and graphs relative to COVID-19 and how it relates to Iredell County. Um, some of those charts and graphs I have given you uh, to kind of give you a little bit of a picture of what our numbers look like. It includes a, a weekly average, a daily average, and of course a cumulative total and things of that nature. We're going to be working to fine tune these charts and graphs and getting those on our website to inform our public as well regarding our numbers and how it relates specific to Iredell County. And then finally, um, I received a surprise phone call right before the meeting started this evening from Commissioner Halp, fresh out of surgery, and he just wanted to make sure that we did pass along his appreciation for all the thoughts and prayers and well wishes as he went through his surgery. He is greatly appreciative of that. And it's good to hear that he still had a sense of humor. When we were getting off the phone, he said, please let them know that I move. I'm going back to sleep. I'm exhausted. <laughs> so um, he did make a motion, and, um, and I, I was appreciative to hear that sense of humor after having uh, a long surgery that he had today. That's all. Thank you. And I would like to add uh, one item. Uh, we've had a significant reduction of calls to 911 for transportation to the emergency room. I just, it would be nice to think that everyone is uh, just, uh, you know, we've turned the corner as far as general wellness. Uh, but we know that's not the case. We have a lot of people out there who uh, may be experiencing a uh, initial signs of a heart attack or uh, stroke. stroke or any number of uh, acute conditions that, that are not quite acute, but they're getting warning signs. And traditionally, those folks have called for 911, been transported, and uh, at the emergency room, they've been able to have very effective and proactive treatment uh, but because of, I think, the COVID situation and the concern that people have about, well, if I go to the hospital, I might catch it, they are not responding and they're not calling 911. And these conditions are getting worse. And then by the time they call, they're in a bad way. And many of the interventions that could have been done uh, early on are no longer available or as effective. So uh, people should be, realize that uh, one of the safest places to go is a hospital. They're all about PPE and gowning up and uh, having uh, everything uh, decontaminated and making sure people are separated. So uh, if you experience any of these issues, please do not uh, sit alone and suffer. Uh, but uh, if it uh, seems to be something that might be something more serious, Please dial 911 and get yourself checked out. Okay, uh, no closed session this evening. Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved, Mr. Chairman. Motion by Vice Chairman Bowles. All in favor, please say aye. Aye. aye.
about it, Marvin. You want to adjourn? Yes. Okay. <laughs> Thank you, sir. It is unanimous. We are adjourned. <laughs>